Welcome to Tiki Central, Canada. Ever wonder what is in that cool, refreshing drink that you just have to have on that hot summer's day? Mmm, yeah. Me too. Picture a man going on a journey beyond sight and sound. Wow! He has left society. He has entered Tiki Central with palm trees, beach sand, blue skies, and... Oh, God, get me a drink now. Here are your hosts, Craig and Cam, and their wacky views and drinks, life, and maybe information? folks how you doing hey everybody all right awesome we're back this is uh episode four we're gonna talk today about tom collins tom collins who is this uh handsome fellow who is tom collins it's actually a drink my friend my drink it's a drink i don't say yes yes and we're also gonna talk about gin today as well so mm. that's kind of we both kind of coincide each other so that's what we're gonna talk oh, about tom collins good. and gin that makes me happy i'm a fan yes, of gin exactly but uh but craig maybe we should uh just do a little intro first, oh, do you for think? ourselves, of course. I am so sorry. My name is Craig Stevens. I'm a bartender. Uh, I've been a bar manager, manager of bars. Um, I've done some cocktail programs for some of the places I've worked at, and I'm like, still working on one right now. And I'm just uh, a tiki nut. I love tiki drinks and the whole culture and everything about mm-hmm. it. Well, I've always considered you about half right on that. Uh, uh, the nut? Well, I... <laughs> Okay, I, I, you know, I am extravagant in some ways, yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, and my, my name's Cam. Uh, I have uh, been residing in Ottawa for uh, a little over a decade. Uh, been enjoying uh, Craig's uh, bartenderly services for several years now, I think. Uh, Matt Tom's, yes. Yes, okay, yes. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm here as an everyman who knows nothing about mixology uh, to learn from the best. Oh, geez, thanks. Yeah. I don't know if I'm the best, but, you know, I do what I can, right? Well, the best in this room at the moment. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, uh, you know, it's a 50-50 shot, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Okay, okay, got gotcha. It, okay, it's good. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to talk about the Tom Collins today. So, that's the drink we're going to talk mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Now, you're saying to yourself, well, okay, the Tom Collins is not exactly a top, uh, tropical drink, right? Like, it's not on a menu of a well, tiki Well, no, and place, I, right? I have to admit, I've I, I've had a couple of Tom Collins's. Uh, Z- 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 yeah. In, is that in, after in a few of those that you start talking like that? Or no, just that's okay? just, that's just. That's how you talk. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah no so why are we talking about Tom Collins because to me it sort of brings to mind very stuffy English types you're right in some ways but the cool thing about some of these drinks is that when you take the regular recipes and then you add stuff to it then you make a whole new cocktail hmm. um, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later uh, but right now we're gonna talk about the history of Tom Collins okay not not the person the not drink. the person the drink okay because so, I know Tom Jones <laughs> Oh, wait. Do I know Tom Jones? No, I don't know any Tom Jones. Okay, mm. okay. Mm. So the first time that you see this published, this drink, is actually back in 1876 by Jerry Thomas. He actually wrote the very first Bartender's Guide. Huh. Very cool guy. Um, uh, what he actually did back then, too, which is really cool, was he actually took bourbon between two containers, uh, two mugs, let's say, example, mm-hmm. lit them on fire, and basically blended them by tossing them back and forth between the two containers, this firing inferno of bourbon. Wow. Very cool. So, I mean, he's sort of, in some ways, you could describe him as the first flair bartender. You know what? You're right. I never thought of it that way. Wow. Well, you see? You see, see I'm I do learning listen something on new. Okay. So, you, you, you do have some input into this every now and then. Okay, I got <laughs> it. Okay, cool. Now, the other story you hear all the time, okay, is in 1891, a gentleman in England who created the drink, and his name is John Collins. Hmm. Hmm. Right? And that, that's his name, and it's back in 1891. So what's with the Collins? So Collins? So the reason why it's not called John Collins, mm-hmm. but Tom Collins, is mm-hmm. because the gin that was used back then, the London Dry Gin, was actually called Old Tom Gin. Mm. And since then, you actually still can get, actually get Old Tom Gin oh, really? at LCBO. Yeah, it's a little lower price here, but it's actually really good gin. Oh, interesting. I've never, I've never had Old Tom, and I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, of quality gin, so I'll have to check oh, that yes, out. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. we'll have to check that and out And it's sometime. a London Dry, you say? So a like, London like Dry. Nice and, yeah, okay. Exactly, nice and smooth. It's not got all kinds of other f- uh, things that are fermented into it. Mm-hmm. It's basically straight up. Right on. As is. Right. 
So, um, what actually is in it, Tom Collins? So, it is going to be the gym. Right. Uh, a simple syrup, which we talked about, which is kind of like a sugar. Mm-hmm. Okay, with sugar and water mixed yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lemon juice. Now, I use lime juice. Now, anytime I see a recipe that has lemon juice on it, I use lime juice. I just find lime juice... Um, what's the word I'm looking it's for? It's got a bit not more so tart. bite. It's got... Well, it's got more bite to it, but it's not as tart. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's easy to play with, easy to work with, I find, and it's a little more uh, easier on the palate. Yeah. Now, you see, I've heard that uh, uh, gins and tonic, or gin and tonics, depending yes. on how you want to say it, yes. like they were originally supposed to be made with lemon. Yes. But I always have it with lime for exactly the exactly. same reason. It's Every just... time you go get a mixed drink, right? It's got yeah. lime on it. Yeah. yeah. That's because I think it had, it, exactly like I said, it's, it's not as tart. It's not as tart and, and sour. Right. It's a little more polished. So, I mean, if, if Tom Collins is made with gin, you can use just basically any gin or? No. Uh, also, sorry, one ingredient we missed on here is cold oh. soda. Okay. Ah, right. Yeah. Yes. Now, so back to your question you just asked, okay? So, no, you don't have to use any particular kind of gin, but do remember there are some gins out there that have some uh, significant, uh, distinct ingredients into them. Mm-hmm. So, one of them is like called a Hendrix gin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's made with cucumbers. So, if you want your Tom Collins to sound, taste a little more on the cucumber y side, mm-hmm. you would use that. Uh, another gin is Bombay Sapphire, which is more floral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that would obviously make it a factor in, on your end of your Tom Collins. I see. Now, the original Tom Collins is actually, like I said, it was made old Tom. Um, London dry gin usually doesn't have all these floral um, flutes in it. Right. It's largely just kind of juniper. And, exactly. Uh, juniper, juniper is the main ingredient that you would find in gin. Exactly. Right. And that's exactly how London dry gin is made. It's made with that as the, the key ingredient. I see. So yeah. so if you're making a Tom Collins, yes. and this is going back a few episodes, but, uh, <laughs> shake it off. You, if you've been paying attention, that mm. is. Yeah. Okay, Mr. James Bond, you actually will shake this mm-hmm. um, and because of the lime juice. It's okay, in there. right. And you want to blend. Now, you want to blend the alcohol with the lime juice. Is right. That, and so, yeah. the, but the soda, you're not gonna you're not gonna shake the soda. That comes in afterwards. Oh, okay. So, so it's just gin and lime. So gin and lime juice and the sugar. Okay. Right, syrup, right. Right. Simple syrup. Yep. Shake that all up. Mm-hmm. Now you pour that into your glass with fresh ice. Remember, we talked about that before. Yeah. Fresh ice. Yeah. Um, and then you're gonna top that off with some soda. I see. Yeah. So. Um, we talked about before um, why is this on our show, right? Well, yeah, because, I mean, you said earlier, like, and I absolutely agree, this isn't a tiki drink. Right. Um, so, but you also indicated that you can, you know, you can add a little something something yeah. to these beverages. So, so what, what makes <laughs> a Tom Collins a tiki Tom? Sure. So one of the drinks actually I created from this, um, I've also, too, if you folks noticed that a lot of these, in, these recipes that we're talking about, Remember the daiquiri on the last show? Mm-hmm. Um, sugar and wa- okay, so sugar and lime juice seem to be the common denominator in almost all these drinks. Yeah, one rots right? your teeth and the other one prevents scurvy. Yeah, so it's a, that balance of sweetness and sour. They're always oh, going to be there. Okay, I right? see. I see. Now, I actually do make a drink. It's called the Jamaican Cherry. And what I did is I take a Tom Collins mm-hmm. and I alter it. So the, the soda that I use in that is a vanilla bean soda. Okay, now Club I remember soda. you mentioned. Yes, we yeah. talked about infusions. Yeah. So I actually purchased uh, vanilla bean soda. So mm-hmm. it's got that vanilla bean taste to it. Mm-hmm. I had a little bit of grenadine in there and mascher cherry liqueur. Mar- maraschino. Maraschino, sorry. Okay. Maraschino. Boy, man. Wow. Um, so you add the cherry liqueur in there. Mm-hmm. You add the grenadine. So you get the cherry effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, then you add the vanilla bean soda, which is going to give it this little tinge of behind. It's cool because when you add the vanilla bean soda in there and people are tasting it, it's almost like they know something's in it and they can't quite name it. Right. Can't you quite ever had that? We have a drink and your tongue on it. So yeah, to speak. you, you drink right. a drink and you're just like, oh, okay, there's something in there. I know, I know it's what something it is. in it, but I can't put my finger on it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. what vanilla bean soda does. It adds a little bit of mystery to it. Isn't that neat? So, yeah. so, so now you're taking a Tom Collins and now you've made it something different. Cool. Yeah. So, so if if somebody wanted to uh, find the, the the right measurements. Uh, for making a, a Jamaican cherry, uh, would they be able to find that on our website? Um, they can. I could actually put that on there for them if they want to. That'd be great. Actually, you know what? Let's do that. Yeah. Let's add the recipe in there. You know what? I'm not worried about it, uh, you know, someone stealing my recipes. Hey, you know what? <laughs> just, just 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 slap a copyright on it. Yeah, exactly. I'll put, I'll put that little logo on the corner there so you yeah. can copyright and be like, no, no. <laughs> so, I mean, l- l- I, I want to go back to gin for just a second yeah, sure. because I, I really enjoy gin. I, I've been, 
uh, particularly partial to a to an unfiltered gin from a uh, an Ontarian company called Dillon's. I really like it, but I'm not. Oh sure. yeah, yeah, I've had this stuff. It's yeah, really good. but but I'm not sure it would be right for this type of drink. Yes. Um, but for somebody who enjoys gin as much as I do, yes. Uh, I don't really know a lot about like its history what, and where it came from. Well, yeah, and all like stuff. like what makes gin gin? Okay, so gin actually started back in, Har- in uh, Holland. Not in England, as we all mm. think, you know, because you hear London dry gin, right? Mm-hmm. It actually was made back in Holland. So and it was act- the Dutch. The Dutch, exactly. Does it involve tulips in any way? <laughs> no. Oh, sure. um, okay. But actually, back then, it was mm. also known as the Dutch Courage. And what that meant was that they would mm. give gin to the soldiers to kind of give them some sort of, you know, comfort of before they would go into a right. battle. Right. You get to liquor it up before yeah, you send them exactly. to the death. Yeah, exactly. If you think about it, yeah. I guess they were all liquored up soldiers running around everywhere. Well, the Brits <laughs> had their rum and the, and the Dutch had their gin. Yeah. Makes sense. Now, the, the cool thing, actually, is Latin word for juniper is juniper. Yeah. Okay. And juniper was actually gin originally from Holland. Right. Yeah. No, right. You and actually, gin, you can gin. see that in yeah. LCBO. Yeah. Oh, yes. really? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. You'll see gin, and then you'll see Jennifer. Oh, yeah. so it's a separate drink. Well, Jennifer is the very first uh, concoction of gin. Right. And then England kind of got their version of it, which right. we call now Dry. gin now. Right, right, right. right. Okay. So they actually still make, in Holland, in Dutch, they still make Jennifer. I see. Um, yeah. So it's pretty cool. That's really now, cool. Now, gin is mostly fermented with juniper, um, the, the plant. Mm-hmm. Okay. And actually, it grows wild. Yeah, no, I've heard that. Actually. Um, yeah. yeah, it's not something that is uh, grown in greenhouses or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like nurseries. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not in those situations. Yeah, you like actually got to yeah, go so hunting exactly, for yeah. it, right? Now, and then also in the gin, there's other ingredients that you can also blend into there. So it'd be like lemons, uh, licorice bark, nuts, berries, okay. herbal roots. So, so, so like, like anise, uh, it's like that, that seed. A N I S anise anus. <laughs> anus wow. um, no, and it's it's a very licorice flavor. Do we need to bleep right? that out now? Okay. <laughs> oh. Too late, so sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you actually look on the side of a bottle of Bombay, mm-hmm. um, it actually shows you all the different uh, multiple ingredients that are inside it. Mm-hmm. So there's juniper in there. There's nuts in there. There's some berries. Uh, some grass roots in there. There's other stuff that's it combined in there to make that very right. uh, complex drink right. or gin. I mean, sorry. So as like as as much as I like gin, yeah. um, it's not something I necessarily always want mixed with mixed drinks because right. it, it it offers such a strong flavor. Right. So like. Like, why is it, is that the reason why you don't see... As many gin drinks, you mean? Yeah. So, the reason why we don't see as many gin drinks is that, actually, way back then, uh, the 1800s and the early 1900s, mm. all up to 1940, mm. most of the drinks we know now were actually made with gin. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And the only reason why that they've changed over, because vodka was introduced to the American, North American culture in 1940, and vodka was cheaper... And had no taste to it, mm-hmm. so the the tasteless sort of wow. spirit. Wow! Because um, you know, back then you could go have a couple of martinis during lunch and go back to work, and of course, yeah, it wouldn't smell it on your breath, right? Yeah. So yeah. gin was actually was the original for almost all those drinks out there, and then eventually they got converted over to our rums and our vodka that we that know now. Interesting. So because those things became cheaper. And more available, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, do, do you happen to know what changed in the 1940s to result in vodka? Was it the Russians? I mean, that's... So, oh, okay, <laughs> let's, so this is an interesting little story. Um, I, uh, my bar, I actually have what's called a Moscow Mule Mug. I'm sure you've seen it. Yes, yeah, mug. yeah, the copper, the hammered okay. copper. Yeah. So the copper mug represents uh, the Moscow Mule, which is actually a drink. It's made with vodka. Mm-hmm. Now, the story behind that is the guy named John Martin, um, back in 1940s, bought, actually, uh, Smirnoff Vodka and brought it over to the United States. Now, he spent $17,000 to actually buy the, the, the product. Back in those days. Now, $17,000 so sounds was like a mint. lot. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? If in 1940, you told me I was spending $17,000 and I'm going to turn into a billionaire, uh, sign oh, me up. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So, he purchased the rights to Smirnoff to bring it to North America. Mm-hmm. And though, he would actually would go to this um, bar called Cock and Bull, which is actually in California. Mm-hmm. Um, it was owned by a guy named Jack Morgan. Jack Morgan also was trying to venture off into a new kind of concept, uh, ginger beer. 
Now, okay, ginger beer, I've heard we of talked about before. Beer, we talked bit, kind of about yeah. before. Ginger beer was kind of actually was originally made with beer. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's more of sort of a ginger ale kind of Exactly, deal, right? yeah. It's yeah. kind of gone the other way. Yeah. It's not alcoholic anymore. Mm-hmm. Now, so they have these two gentlemen, John Martin, he's got, you know, Smirnoff Vodka, mm-hmm. and Jack Morgan. Now, mm-hmm. Vodka, like I said, was just being introduced at that time. He was just bringing it to North America. Right. Back then, it was bourbon, whiskey, and rum. Sure. That was it. Yeah. Okay, and gin. And gin. And gin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, he's like, well, how, how do I, how do how I do get I this into the this? market? How do I get this to explode? How do I get this to sell? Well, you you throw a match in it and it'll yeah. explode. Quite <laughs> nice. Sorry. This is this is true. <laughs> so um, couldn't resist. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cough. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, and along comes this lady from Russia, comes into the bar, and she's selling copper mugs. Now she's from Russia. She actually uh, came directly from Russia, and her dad actually owned a copper factory. Sure. Um, that's convenient. Yes. So, well, because well, back then in the war, uh, all the guys that would be out in the field or uh, fighting the wars would actually have copper mugs. And the reason why is because copper mugs maintain the temperature better, mm-hmm. uh, longer. Oh, okay. And also, when you add lime juice to copper, it actually interacts. The, it's a chemical reaction. Oh, really? uh, and it prevents scurvy. Oh, really? Yes. I see. Okay. So, they were like, wait a minute now. Let's take her copper mug. I'll take your Smirnoff. I'll take my ginger beer. Add a bit of lime juice and boom, we have the Moscow Mule. And so, that's where that came from. Wow. Now, I think we're sidetracked a bit here. I yeah, can't even remember what we were talking I, I about just, here. Well, I was really curious hey, about that. It's but... a cool story. So, no, no, okay, so there's more. Hang on, we've got some time for this. We can, we can talk about this. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what ended up happening was that he had, so we made the Moscow Mule. Mm-hmm. So then John Martin was like, well, okay, how am I supposed to go across North America and do this? Mm-hmm. No problem. So what he did is he took the Smirnoff, took the copper mugs, he bought all 1,000 mugs from this lady. Awesome. Okay. Went across North America, and every bar he hit, he would give them the mug, and he'd uh, take two pictures. Okay. One picture was with him yeah. uh, and the bartender holding the mug, and that would go into his photo album that he would carry around with him everywhere uh, he went. Okay. The other one would stay on the bar, mm. and this is how he sold Smirnoff Vodka, really? and it is now a two, three billion dollar industry now. Remarkable. Yeah, and Remarkable. that's how that happened. Mm. So... We've been talking a lot about mixed drinks, yes, and and you know a various complexity and that type of yes. thing. Now, a term that I think everybody has heard, or at least you know adults have heard, is cocktails. Cocktails, so, my favorite thing. Yeah. So I mean, like, <laughs> like, w- 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 would you consider? So this is a mixed drink, like a rum yes. and coke. Is that um, a cocktail? No, no, not really. I don't okay. think that is a cocktail. I, I consider that as more um, a built drink, and I consider it more just a barrel. All right, so right, you're so, just your rum, and you're just adding some coke or so. Vodka so that begs the question, my friend. Yes. So what makes a cocktail a cocktail? What makes a cocktail? So the actual definition of a cocktail is: so you take a spirit, be it rum, vodka, uh, gin, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Okay, you mix in some sugar, uh, be it simple syrup or ice or sugar cube or whatever it is. Whatever. Okay. okay? And then um, lime juice or something that is bitter. Mm. Okay. So the actual Sour definition bitter, is or, yeah. a spirit, sugar. Bitters and water. Oh, okay, so you're like, well, wait a minute now. We're watering down our drinks now? <laughs> no, the water actually is the ice. Ah, okay. Ice is okay. critical to a cocktail. Okay. So take any cocktail you think about and no make it without you ice. rambled so long about it uh, <laughs> in our first episode. That's there. right. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, when I get into something, I get knee deep into it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Apparently. Yeah. So... Okay, so make any kind of cocktail. Just try us at home, folks. Make any kind of cocktail. Daiquiri, Tom Collins, whatever you want to make. Mm-hmm. And make it without ice. Don't shake it. Just pour the ingredients in there. If you want to shake it, shine. Just dry shake it, which means no ice. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then put all the ingredients together. Mix now, it all up. Mix yeah. it all up. Drink that. And now make that drink with ice. Mm-hmm. You're going to see a huge, huge, huge difference. And like, like, is it the flavor? I mean, obviously the texture would be a little bit different. The texture would be different, but also too, what water does in most spirits, it actually brings out the spirits, uh, all the tangents in the spirits and all the different, um, like characteristics, characteristics of the yeah. spirit. So example, people who drink scotch mm-hmm. will drop one or two little drops of water in there or mm-hmm. add a one ice cube, one ice cube. Yeah. Because that, that does is it brings out all the tangents and all the flavors of that scotch. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing when you're talking about cocktails. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. water and the ice, and when you're actually shaking it and slightly diluting it, mm-hmm. is important. It is part of the whole um, complex of that drink. I see. Um, if you don't add water, you're going to have something that has something, A, very strong, 
um, you know, it's going to be very powerful and you're not going to want to drink more than one. Yeah. And two, you, it, the water helps combine and, and connect everything together and fuse everything together. I see. And so that's what that does. So, I mean, it sounds to me, to a certain extent anyway, like, you know, you've got a bit of a pet peeve when it comes to people not <laughs> recognizing the value of, of, of you know, appropriately applied right. liquid, like water. <laughs> Um, but that actually reminds me of something you said, I think, in our previous episode, yes. uh, where you were talking about uh, uh, the importance of spouts. Yeah, so pore spouts. So yeah. there's different types of pore spouts out there, folks, and they actually are all different in some way. So um, the couple of spouts that I have in my bar, uh, also at my work, mm. and I pretty well insist with my boss, I'm sure he's listening somewhere along the line, mm. that uh, these are important things and important tools. So um, a couple of spouts that are out there is one is called a speed spout. Mm. And a speed spout is something you'll see on a bar rail, mm -hmm. usually in a bar rail. Mm -hmm. um, also, too, um, on something that has, like, shots. So, example, at my work, and you've been there, uh, some people do Jameson shots, right? Sure, yeah. Now, Jameson shots, if you try to pour that through, uh, say, a, a spout that's bent or it's got a screen on the end of it to, to prevent uh, fruit flies. Right. Um it's just messy. It's hard to pour. It's very whatever. And it takes a long time to pour it. Yeah, well, it's a fairly viscous uh, liquid, right? right? Yeah. Like, say, if you took Sambuga, right? If you took Sambuga and you try to pour oh, that through syrup, yeah. It's syrup, right? Yeah. So, a speed spout is basically it's what it's for is to pour quickly and fast and efficient. Okay. Yeah. And that's what that one is. Now, there's also one called Sure Shot. And um, what you'll see, not too often you see this. It's kind of, I don't know why bars have kind of gone away from it because actually it's a really good tool. So in a, a sure shot, it actually has bearings in there um, inside, in, the, inside the pore spout. And mm -hmm. what it does is when you turn it upside down, the bearings play in measurement. So what they do is that once you pour, pour to one ounce, the bearing will fall down and cut off the supply to the channel. In other words, stopping it from pouring. Oh, well, that's great. So you don't need to worry about wasting. Measuring. Yeah. It's just boom. One I mean, as a customer, it's terrible, but. Uh, you get exactly yeah. what you ordered. <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah. Uh. You can't just top it, it off there. Right. Come, on, yeah. uh, you know. come on. Come on. Come on. And you know me. Come on. <laughs> um, and that's what those used to be for. Uh, I used to use them all the time because then that way you don't have to measure anything in, a, in a, a measuring cup or a jigger. You just pour it and boom, you got one ounce. Right, right. Yeah. Now, another one else you'll see too is called a screen one. One you said that that's for like fruit flies and yeah, stuff? Yeah, so what it is is on uh, something that you on your back bar usually mm -hmm. um, that you're not going to use very frequently. It's usually on liqueurs. Like I was going to say like sweet sugars, stuff, right? Yeah, right? okay. Like creme de, creme de. Yeah. Um, all those are going to have these screens, pour spouts on them because that prevents fruit flies. And you're not using it very often. And usually when you're pouring it, you're not pouring it for speed. You're pouring it just to pour it into a shaker or something like that. So yeah. it's... Um, you're more it's, measuring it's it out. More measuring it out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other one is a spill sp stop one. Mm -hmm. um, and that one uh, you'll see again for shots. And that's another okay. one where basically it's a very narrow one. Um, it pours exactly perfectly into a shot glass and it right. stops it. And then that's else. it. Yeah. So why is it, and yes. I mean you've told me this, but, but why is it that it upsets you? You get all fussed. <laughs> You know, um, I've when, been doing it for so long, I know, but, 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 but is it pure, like you, you get a bit fussed if, if your, your bartender doesn't use the appropriate spout for the appropriate beverage, what is it? Come or on. Or the, the measuring tool, right? Yeah, exactly. Like he yeah. Use or whatever. So the, the thing is that you gotta remember folks as a bartender, you are a chef. So you're just like a chef that's in a kitchen. Hmm. Now, if you're a chef in a kitchen, you know, there's a recipe you got to follow. And if you use that recipe exactly the way it is, you're going to get exactly the result you want. It's a mm -hmm. perfect meal, looks amazing, tastes great, has great texture to it, and everything else. If you're doing so-so uh, measurements on things, and you're kind of wishy-washy on measurements and stuff, and you're putting too much of this and not enough of that, it is going to affect the final product. Right. Um, and I see so many bartenders that do this. They either they short pour or over pour. Um, the big thing too is a key example as a customer. I'm pretty sure if you got a, let's say your Tom Collins, okay, sure, you got your Tom Collins and he's put in like say three ounces of gin into that thing. Hey yo, uh, you're happy, but don't you think it's also gonna taste so alcoholic that you're gonna be like, wow, this is so powerful. I don't know if I can have another one of these things. Fair enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, it has to be a balance, um, and that's one of the things that I'm big time on. Um, when I make any kind of cocktails, I actually ask the customer after I've made it and give it to them and they've tasted it for a while. I'm like, hey, how is that? Hmm. You know, does that taste good? Does that work so, for you? So, okay, I've got a couple of questions. So. Yes. 
Number one, yes. now now I understand with a couple of these these um, spouts you've talked about where yes. it, it's essentially self-measuring. That's easy. Yes. But when you're not using one of those, if yes. you're the bartender, you know, and you're on a rush, like, you yeah. know, it's busy, how, how do you keep it consistent and make sure that you don't have somebody, you know, sort of coughing up three ounces of gin? Sure. So there's a couple of things you can do here. One is called a jigger. And we've all seen that. That's kind of like the little sphere triangle on top of a sphere triangle. Um, yes, yes. You, it's a strange-looking... I mean? it's, it's two-sided. It's got two sides to it. It's, uh, you know, cone on cone kind of thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's called a jigger, and that's for measurement. And usually there's two measurements on it. One's like one ounce, one's a half ounce. And so mm -hmm. between the two of those... And it's it's very efficient when you, you have to be fast. Right. You just kind of put it pour over... Pour it in, and you dump yeah. it in, pour it in, and dump it in. Right. Um, another one that most of us use... When we're using exact measurements, is a shot glass. I usually use a okay, two-ounce sure. shot glass because mm -hmm. on the two-ounce shot glass, it's going to have one ounce, uh, one and a half ounce, and two ounces. Well, and I guess you got a room, a bit of room for spillage there. Yeah, as well. because if you use a one-ounce shot glass, you got to go right to the very top. Right, right, right. This way, you don't have to go all the way top, and it kind of you can speed a little faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one of the things that you can do to okay. keep it consistent. But now you also mentioned balanced. Yeah. So a drink needs to be balanced, like we talked about before. That sweet and sour. Uh, combination we talked about. Remember yeah, every yeah. drink we've seen so far in the last little while has usually been s simple syrup and lime juice, right? Like a little balance. Yeah, and I know, like I know, in beer, for example, it can mean, uh, you know, like a balance between kind of hoppiness and maltiness. Right. Because there's certain beers that you obviously that you drink that, like, hey, it's got that balance. Maybe for you, it's more hoppier. Absolutely. And that's the balance that you want. Them hops don't punch me in the face. They're doing <laughs> something wrong. Yeah. But then you have other people where they can't drink hoppy beers mm -hmm. and they want mm -hmm. something a little lighter. Sure. And so that balance is now swayed over towards that way. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was talking about just previously a few minutes ago was that when I make a drink and I go to the customer afterwards and do like a little, what's called check back, mm -hmm. I ask them like, you know, how is it? Is it too sweet, too sour? Mm -hmm. I actually had one, um, you were there on Friday. We had this little yeah. get together at yeah. my, my work there. And uh, one of the ladies ordered a drink and she was, um, I asked her afterwards and she's like, well, it's kind of a little sour. I said, no problem. So I'll add some simple syrup and I'll balance it out. Right. And so I added some more simple syrup to her, stirred it, stirred it for her, gave it back to her. And she was like, you know what? That's great. I love mm -hmm. it. I'm going to order another one of these. So it's really like, it's really about the end user, so to speak. Right. If you forgive my, uh, you know, Silicon Valley chat. There. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So, I mean, th there's no shame as a bartender in, in going to your customers and saying, hey, like, so does that kind of tickle your fancy? Yeah. Or do you, you know? Well, okay, think about it. Okay, if a chef sits or makes a meal, right? Mm -hmm. And then he brings it out and the waiters bring it out. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that the waiter go back and say, okay, so is the uh, the duck, is it fine tonight? Mm -hmm. Isn't that too dry, not too wet? Mm -hmm. So there's questions that even a, sh uh, a waiter will ask for and on behalf of the chef, right? Sure. Sure. So it's the same thing as a bartender, and it's nothing worse than I see that, and I've actually had this happen to me. We were at some um, bar, and uh, we ordered a Caesar. Mm -hmm. It was so potent and so much Worcester sauce in there, mm. I didn't order another one. Okay. I was like, I'm yeah. done. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to have a beer, and I think we're going to be out of here. Right. So I didn't have a good time, yeah. and that's the whole point. I mean, we, we talk about tiki culture and stuff. Is, is it, you're escaping society, and you want to have a good time. Mm. And it's kind of hard to have that when your drink tastes like crap. And you're going cross-eyed. And you're going cross-eyed. <laughs> 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 well, Cam does that on a regular basis anyway. So anyways, but one of the things we also talked about, you just talked about when we talked a slightly a bit about is balance. So right. let's break it down. So on a, in a drink, you should have between one and a half to two ounces of alcohol or spirits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there should be about three ounces of mix in there. And that could be whatever it is, be okay. it juices or lime juice or, or sugar or whatever that is. And that balances it out. Mm -hmm. That makes it so it's a nice, even drink. Okay, and yeah, you're looking at about six ounces in total, I guess. Correct. Or You'd like be surprised, you know, six, yeah. six ounces, but you, once you shake it and you add it to ice, it, uh, it, it okay. fills an 18-ounce glass very nicely. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. then we talk about dilution, right? Because then at that point now, it's not diluted. Mm -hmm. So either A, you're going to drink it fast, and then you're going to want another one. Mm -hmm. Or B, it's going to start to slightly dilute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're just chit-chatting in the cocktail. It's just part of the experience that you're having at that time. Sure. You're talking to people and you're engaging. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. therefore. Mm -hmm. And that's also what we talked about, remember, the importance of ice. I mean, if you, uh, I, I have a drink and I don't want it to melt fast and yeah, get you all watered down. Yeah, you don't want slushy right, gawk. Then mm -hmm. I'm going to put it in a bigger cube. Sure. Right? Yeah. And that's exactly what I do when I have uh, parties. Mm. So, cool. You're the biggest cube, Craig. <sighs> I'm such an L7, ain't I? <laughs> <laughs> At least when it comes to this stuff, anyway, folks. And that's why it. I'm here. I am trying to be the professional here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Despite my best efforts. All right. <laughs>
Cautionary Tales. All right, so we're going to talk about Cautionary Tales. Uh, hey, cautionary we're back tales, to this. My favorite and spot. By the way, I am appreciating, and I'm sure Cam has probably heard some feedback on us. We're actually, we were kind of we're kind of concerned when we first talked about this. A little bit. Doing it. And we were actually getting really a really good chunk of positive feedback on this. Mm-hmm. I can't believe how well it's going with the Cautionary Tales that people actually want to hear more. Um, so thank you very much for your, your output, uh, the input there, folks, by the way, on, on this whole thing. And by the way, don't forget, uh, we, we'll talk about it later, obviously, at the bottom of the show. If you do want to give us a comment, do we feel free to give us a comment. Absolutely. Yeah. Misery loves company. <laughs> That's right. So the cautionary tale I want to talk about today is my, my turn. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, my turn again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... The cautionary tale I want to talk about is the cop chase. Um, so that's the title of this one. And what it is, uh, that the cop chase. Cop chase. So you've got five, me and four of my friends were sitting in my house and we're drinking beers. And this is in the summertime. And the, where I was living, it was like a community of townhouses. So there'd be like one sort of corner store at the end of the townhouses. Sure. And attached to that corner store was like the community pool. Okay, I, right? I know exactly what you know what I mean. Like yeah. where it's open from like eleven a.m. and they closed it like nine eight or something, and then they or closed or it down. Yeah. yeah. So you know it wasn't open uh, late at night. So yeah. we're sitting there drinking beers, and of course we're bored, and so we're like, "Hey, well, let's go out and venture." And well, how so, old were you at this point? Um, uh, I guess I was like eighteen, nineteen at the okay. time. Okay. It was quite a while ago. Yeah. yeah. I'm not yeah. giving up my age. No, we're not talking about that. No, yeah. no, no, no. Have I, you heard of the Mesozoic era? <laughs> The historical. I, I didn't do. I didn't type things into templates that, that oh, you're talking okay. about. Okay. Yeah, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't invented <laughs> chisels yet. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Craig. I couldn't resist. Yeah, you're just digging me today. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. You know it. So uh, wait, wait. It's supposed to be my cautionary tale. Why are you? Why are you interacting? Ah, uh, okay. Good point. Good <laughs> point. I'll keep my fat trap shut. <laughs> so, so anyways, we're, we're drinking. We're bored. We go out, and uh, all the guys were like, "Hey, let's just go skinny dipping in the pool." Mm. It's not open. We'll just jump the fence and just go. And of course, uh, above the pool was the, the rooftop to the conve- the convenience store. Ah, so you could climb up there perfect. and jump off into the gotcha. pool. Yeah. Now, um, I'm not a person for skinny dipping. Mm-hmm. I was never say. have been, never will be. Bunch of I don't know why. Naked in a pool. Because it's yeah. all guys. Like, hello, yeah. sausage fest. What's yeah. going on there? Yeah. I know. It's, it's I guess it happens. Something. I know. I know. Yeah. So anyways, I'm sitting off the side clothed mm-hmm. and they're jumping in the pool. Mm-hmm. Well, the next thing you know, we hear cherries and we hear mm-hmm. sirens and we hear a megaphone going, hey, you guys in the pool. Mm-hmm. So we take off. We all jump the fence. Sure. But so you're the only one with clothes on. I'm the only one with clothes on. <laughs> so I jump the fence with my buddy and uh, the other three take off the other direction. So I'm following my, my friend through the townhouses mm-hmm. in between them. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping to God he knows where he's going. And actually, by accident, he runs out to the real middle of the road right into a front of a cop car. Oh, so he, he, the cop grabs both of us and he's like, hey, you guys, you know, can you just stand here? You know, we need to check things out. You know, you weren't supposed to be there. And we're like, yeah, we know we weren't supposed to be there. Yeah. Um, and my mom's listening. I'm sure she hasn't heard yeah. the story. So she's I'm well, going to hear the phone ringing in about two seconds. It's here. the sheepish. Yes, yeah. officer. Yeah. So anyways, um, we could hear his radio because he had his radio like the okay. walkie talkie on sure. his, on his yeah. uniform. Yeah. So apparently a female cop was chasing one of my friends who did not have clothes on. Hmm. And um, being a female cop chasing a male without mm-hmm. clothes on, you can imagine. Yeah. It's so she's trying to be awfully professional, mm-hmm. but she's laughing <laughs> as she's running down the street chasing my friend Frank. And yeah, Frank was the guy the at the time yeah. uh, to the point where she can't catch up to him because she's laughing so hard. <laughs> yeah. So um, he got away. Right. And... Um, so of course we're trying not to laugh because the cop and, and the, co- the cop that's there actually there on with his walk probably he's trying not to laugh yeah um so what ended up happening is that yeah he let us go he's like you know hey guys like just stay at the pool you know i don't you didn't cause any damage and you didn't mean to you know no no harm is done yeah but just stay at the pool hmm. and so we meet up with frank afterwards and he's like you know can like he's trying to tell us like Man, I'm so fast. I'm so fast. I outran the cop. I said, no, uh, I think, Frank, what it was yeah. is that she was laughing so hard that she couldn't catch up to you. That's beautiful. And that's my cautionary tale. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Although, although, I mean, as a cautionary tale, there's not much, like, to be cautionary about. I mean, if anything, well, I think the motto is... first of all, yeah, when you're drinking, you're don't do something stupid cops. like, hey, let's go skinny dipping in the public pool. Mm. That's kind of the motto for this one anyways, yeah. because, you know, yeah. the authorities will eventually catch up to you. Yeah. Or, hey, in Frank's case, I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So um, just like we've always talked about, guys, the cautionary tale is something that is cautionary. We do not are not promoting uh, drinking or any kind of consumption of alcohol to the point where you actually are blitzed or drunk or whatever, being stupid. These are tales we all have. We all were young at one point and being stupid. And we know better now than we did back then. Exactly. It's a life lesson, right? Mm -hmm. So we learn from them. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you guys have done this, you've now learned a lesson. Did you know? So we're going to go up to Did You Know? I did not. (laughs) No, you didn't. So, gin was actually used back in the 1600s, because today our theme is gin. Mm. Um, was back in the 1600s. actually was used as a medical purpose because of the juniper in it, right? Oh, so, it was actually a medicine. Me. Yeah. yeah, so it was actually was a medicine. And like I said before, juniper was growing wild, so it never, it's never harvested. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, okay, so here's a question for Cam. Who is the highest, what, what country is the highest consumption of gin? The highest consumption of gin. I bet you're not going to guess in a billion years. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say England because as far as I'm aware of right, we all, right, right, we all yeah. think that London gin, right? Yeah, yeah. No. It's actually the Philippines. The Philippines has the highest Philippines. consumption in the world at 43%. 43% of gin goes to the Philippines. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing also too, during Prohibition, um, there was also what's called bathtub gin back then made in bathtubs. I've, I've, I've heard of this. I've actually heard of more modern versions of it, but I'm not yes. sure it's good. Now, the problem back then was actually that people would throw in whatever was available to them. Um, so some of them actually were poisonous chemicals like methanol. Oh, So okay. people would get sick the wrong and actually die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go blind. So uh, as desperate as you were during Prohibition, you be careful what you drink because it could kill you. Right. Well, and I've actually <laughs> heard of modern situations like that in, in other countries where there's certain levels of Prohibition. So... Uh, I know, for example, in India, relatively yes. o- over the past couple of years, there's been a fair number of people who have died due to um, illegal production of alcohol using things like antifreeze and, and that type of thing. I think thing. I've heard so, that too. Yeah, it's, it's pretty horrific when, uh, when it does so, happen. I mean, I know a prohibition, you obviously can't drink during that time and, and it's restricted. Mm-hmm. But are you that, I, mean, I'm, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd be that desperate. To, mm. to the point where someone's mm. drinking something that's questionable and I'm hearing that people are dropping like flies. Yeah. I think I'd be like, you know what? I'll stick with my cola. I think I'll stick mm. with my Coca-Cola and that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I guess boredom is a powerful motivator. I don't yeah, know, yes. But, uh, yeah. Now, here's yeah. another one little small fact we're going to add into this, okay? Mm-hmm. Is that gin actually is made with a mixing, is, is actually was made as a mixing spirit. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that, if you look at any other spirit, rum, whiskey, bourbon, um, bourbon not so much, but uh, vodka, mm-hmm. those are spirits actually you can drink straight. Sure. Yeah. Right? So bourbon you can drink straight, rum yeah. you can drink straight, vodka you drink straight. Yeah. Gin was actually made to be mixed. Oh, really? Think about it. How many times you go to a bar and some guy goes, hey, I'll have a uh, Hendrix straight up neat, please. Or, okay. hey, I'll get a Bombay neat, please. Yeah. Y- you don't hear that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not it's not meant to be drinking straight. It's meant to be mixed. I actually, uh, uh, interestingly enough, I remember in the early two thousands, I was living in southeastern China. Yes. And uh, I ordered a gin and tonic, and I was literally brought a glass of gin and a glass of oh, tonic. Oh no! Yeah. So what you were able to mix the ratio that you wanted to? I think it was more that there was a bit of a cultural misunderstanding ah, because I had okay. to pay for them separately. You. No way. Yeah. Oh, so, no. So I, I completely understand Oh, no. That. Oh, no. <laughs> so, but, I mean, I mean, one of the things that, that kind of I'm curious about. So, I yes. mean, if gin, if gin is a mixing beverage. Yes. Um, and you know it's for mixing. I mean, I imagine that as a mixologist, you yes. know, when, when you think about gin, you think about creating or, or blending flavors with it and making new Correct. Drink. Yes. So, all this to say, like, how do you go about, like, like, where do you get your inspiration for new drinks? Right. So, actually, the, very good question because you know what? It just happens to be our mailbag today. Oh, you're kidding me. No, no, no. So, the question actually that we've got today for mailbag, and we're, we're going into our mailbag segments, it's all good. You know, just happens to be, you know, I, are you telepathic or something it might or be that, Sixth yeah. Sense or something? It's pretty, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. I'm pretty impressed with there. Yeah. So, anyways, um, the question that I've been asked is where do you get your inspiration and in, from when uh, you create new drinks? So the inspiration I get, and I'm, again, a mixologist is just starting out. I'm not, you know, 
some of these guys I see out there that are um, like Andes. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you go to mm-hmm. Andes, those guys are serious. They're mm-hmm. the real deal. Yeah, for those of you folks who aren't from uh, Ottawa, Ottawa Andes, it is a, a serious cocktail place. Schmancy cocktail place at the top of a hotel. Uh, very ritzy, and mm-hmm. I think the drinks are about probably twenty dollars a drink. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just uh, it's insane. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I, how I get my inspiration is a couple things. One, if I buy, um, I've been told, and this is what I learned along the way, when you buy a bottle of liquor, that you should be able to make at least two drinks with that bottle of liquor. I see. So in other words, don't have a bottle on your bar that serves no purpose, hmm. just because of the sake of having it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I've learned over the years that I get a bottle of liquor. I'll either research that bottle of liquor out. Uh, some of the websites, by the way, folks, when you go to the Spirits websites, they actually give you recipes. Like the brand's websites. Kind exactly. Of right. They'll give exactly. you recipes yeah. for their product. Yeah. Um, and from that, you can always branch out, like we talked about. Take a regular drink that you, you've now you've learned now mm-hmm. and branch it out into something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also, too, what's happened in history. The other process is taking a recipe that you found and then modifying it and making it something different. Now, this has happened in the past. So, example, the Americano which is uh, Campari, um, su- sweet vermouth, and soda water, mm-hmm. okay, became the Negroni. And the reason why it, that happened is because the guy goes, well, I want to be a little stronger, so they add gin to it. I see. Therefore, Americano became the Negroni, and a daiquiri turned into a whiskey sour and turned into a gin fizz. Oh. So you could take one drink, and then when you add something to it or modify it, then also you've now created something completely new. Sure. Right, but you've used that original recipe as kind of your jumping as off. your base, yeah, your right? springboard, exactly. Right. And so that's what I've done in the past. I've taken either a, I've done a liquor bottle and researched it out and found recipes for it, or b, I've taken a, a original cocktail that I found and then modify it. Um, there's one example that I'm doing right now. It's um, Chambord Royale, which is an old drink from the 1930s. Hmm. And I've sort of spruced it up into a millennium version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and we'll get to try that sometime soon, I'm hoping. Good. Um, really good drink. And again, I just took original recipe that I found and then modified it. Hmm. And that's how that's done. Wonderful. Cool. So, that is our show, folks. I hope that, that you enjoyed is. it. Um, I hope you got to learn a little bit about gin and, and the Tom Collins and all the history I of that. I did. And we even threw Moscow Mule in there. We we actually threw in two drinks in there today. Yeah, that's pretty good. And, and sort of indirectly, mugs as well. yeah. I mean, copper mugs look look great at all occasions. Oh, uh, I love my those. copper mug. And you know the great thing is, nobody could say it's theirs because because yeah, one of we a always kind, has right? a copper mug. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So let's go through some information you might need to know about us. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We have a website called www.tikicentralcanada.ca. All one word. All one word. That's right. And on there you'll see our smiley faces. Well, actually. Uh, Cam, that's fine. I'm kind of smirking. He's kind of smirking and waving and telling him no more retakes, not happening. Um, And also tell him the bottom there, you will see some links um, to blogs. You also will see links to other episodes that we've had. And if you don't have iTunes, um, by the way, please subscribe, folks. Uh, When you subscribe, it does show up on our, our metrics, and then we know that at least the people, uh, how many people are out there listening to us. Yeah, lets us know. And getting us sort of instant feedback without even you trying to give us feedback. Scratches our itch. Exactly. And then we know we're, they know we're doing this for a purpose, right? Um, so, but also, too, I just was going to say, um, so there's an iTunes uh, link on there. There's also a Google Play link on there. So for people who have Androids and other devices, you can actually click on that. And uh, say if you're in your car or you're somewhere else and you don't have access to either of those, there's also a link you can click, and it actually gives you the podcast directly, right from our site. And um, we talked about it, uh, mailbag. Um, mailbag is always good. And cautionary tales. Uh, if you have a cautionary tale, please, please do and, and uh, submit it, and we'll definitely bring it across on our, one of our future episodes. And any question or comments? Um, we love to hear comments, bad or good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay on the bad ones. I'm not quite sure about Cam. He kind of takes it personal. I'm a bit fragile. <laughs> he is a little fragile on the edges, folks, and that's why he drinks Mad Tom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the flavor, damn it. Sure, let's just call it that. Yeah. Anyway, folks, uh, we're going to go on our way, and uh, we're going to go down and make some Tom Collins, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later, okay? Take care, guys. All right, later, See folks. See you next time. Bye. Well, I don't know about you, but I got it for Hey guys, right? Hey, where's my drink? Hey, where's my drink?